I know a lot of times after the sermon and after worship is over and you go get something to eat and just before your nap you call mother to let her know that you went to church. And mother usually says uh, something like, well, uh, what was the sermon on? And normally you say, um, it was a good one. I'm sure it was a good one. You don't remember. So this morning I entitled the sermon Zombies, so that you will remember what the sermon was about. This being almost Halloween, I thought this would be a good one to talk about. Uh, I was the congregation where I was uh, converted to Christ and where I spiritually grew up. We had an elder who hated Halloween. I mean, he hated it. And uh, we had to be very careful. We didn't even say the word in church. And uh, he just thought it was an awful, evil thing. And, and you know, he's got kind of a point. It does. There's a, lots of ghosts and goblins and a lot of, of evil things that go around Halloween. But for most of us, we just treat it like another holiday and it's just a man-made tradition and it doesn't have to be evil and uh, and I like candy so I kind of like Halloween always so but I have to confess to you I am not an expert on zombies in fact you're not gonna believe this I'm 60 years old I have never watched a zombie movie in my entire life unless you count Scooby-Doo all right that's that's the only one I've ever seen I've never I did it's never been something that I've been interested in sitting down and watching it's never appealed to me and I actually had to look up the dictionary definition of a zombie and so let me share that with you a zombie is a willis and speechless human as in voodoo belief and in fictional stories held to have died and been supernaturally reanimated that is the definition of zombies, and that's what we normally think of. But I'm not going to talk about those kind of zombies. The kind of zombies I'm going to talk about are not necessarily speechless. They may not necessarily be willless. But they're the kind that walk around talking, breathing, acting like they are alive, but actually inside they're dead. They're spiritually dead. And so three points that we're going to make this morning. I'm going to talk about how we start off alive. And the, then point B will be then we die. And point C will be and then we're made alive again. So real easy to follow along with. First point A, we start off alive. Hopefully you have the outline in front of you and you're open to Psalms 139. That's the first uh, passage we're going to be looking at. Well, that we'll be reading together. We're going to look at another one. Because under point one, I want to make the point as we start off alive that God created Adam and Eve and gave them the breath of life. Created is what goes in your first blank. That passage in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. God created Adam in a very special way. He took some dirt and formed that dirt into a man and breathed into him life and his life was created. And we'll not read it, but you know also Eve was created in a very special way, taken from one of Adam's ribs and he fashioned the woman after the man. And so Adam and Eve were created in a very special way. But point number two after that, life starts at conception. It is started at conception for every person born after that. In Psalms 139, hopefully you are there and you can read along with me. In verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book 
were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. You know, David describes here that even though we know that he naturally, how, how life comes about inside of the mother's womb, he says, you formed me, God. You're the one that did that. And you knew me. You knew my days before they were numbered. You, you were there. He says at the end of verse 14, my soul knows it very well. His soul was inside his body prior to being born. That's what this verse says. Look at chapter 127 of Psalms and verse 3. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in the gate. These are just a couple of verses that talk about how life begins before birth. At conception is when life begins. The Bible describes humans as being alive before their birth and as God being involved in their lives. According to the Bible, insolment, that's, that's when the, the soul enters into the body. That occurs before birth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. There's a lot of other verses I'm not going to give you because this is not a sermon on abortion. Right? But, but I want you to see and I want you to know that the Bible does state very clearly that a soul, a human being, exists prior to the moment that it comes into the world through birth. Life begins the moment of conception. Therefore, we as Christians believe that a deliberate destruction of a human embryo or of an unborn baby is murder. We believe that life begins at conception. But that's physical life. Spiritual life also begins then. As soon as there is a soul, a child, when it is born, it is born innocent and pure and alive spiritually. And we remain alive. We remain in that state until we know what sin is. We choose wrong over right and we separate ourselves from God. How do we know if we are dead or alive spiritually? Well, number three, having others think that you are alive is not what makes you alive. We have an example in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, where an entire church, the church in Sardis, had a reputation for being alive. Everybody said, what a lively church that church in Sardis was. But when Jesus sent a message through John, the revelator, to this church in Sardis. Notice what he tells them. I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So just having somebody think that you're alive is not what makes you alive. You may be dead because, number four, when you give in to sinful pleasures, you are losing your life. You are dead, even while you are still living. Uh, this scripture, 1 Timothy 5, verse 6. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. She's a zombie. That's what that verse is saying. She is dead even while she lives. And so we're born with life, spiritual life, but we lose it. Let's talk a little bit about, more about that. B. When we die. How do we know when we die spiritually? Well, number one, being away from the Father, Father is what goes in your blank, who is our source of life, that is the same. That's the meaning, actually, of being dead in Luke chapter 15. We all know the story about the prodigal son and how he wanted his share of the state, and he goes off and he wasted on wild living. There's a famine in the land. He is forced to take a job feeding pigs. And for a Jew to have to feed pigs, there is no more lowly job than that. Uh, pigs are unclean animals to the Jews. As he's feeding the pigs, he's longing for the, the pig slop. 
What the pigs were eating, he's looking at that saying, hmm, man, that looks good. Now that means you're really hungry. When pig slop starts looking good, you're pretty hungry. And the Bible says he came to his senses. He says, man, my, my father's hired me and eat better than this. I should go back to my father. But I, man, I kind of kind of burned the bridge there and I don't deserve to go back to the father. I know what I'll do. I'll go back and I'll just ask if he would just let me be a hired hand. That'd be better than where I'm at. So he goes back to the father and he... He starts giving this prepared speech about how I'm not worthy to be your son. And, and the father just stops and says, you know, it's nonsense. He says, kill the fatted calf. Bring the robe and the ring and put it on him. For he says here in verse 24, this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and has been found. Notice the word he uses. My son was dead. What made him dead? Being away from the Father is the same as being dead. But he comes back to the Father, he's alive. The son had an older brother who was very jealous. He saw the celebration going on and he just, he was fuming mad. The, the father went and talked to the older son about it. He says, man, dad, I've been here and I've been slaving away and I've been working for you this whole time. You never killed the fatted calf for me. You never did this for me. And the father explained in verse 32, we had to celebrate for this brother of yours was dead and has become alive again. He was lost and has been found. The way you know if you're dead is if you are separated from the father. If your relationship with the Father is broken, if you're not uh, right with God, then you are spiritually dead. Number two, we turn into spiritual zombies because transgressions sap away the life out of us. It draws the life away from us. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And he says later in verse 5, Even when we were dead in our transgressions. Sin kills us. Do you think about sin that way? Sometimes we get a little lighthearted about sin. We know that, that God is gracious and forgiving and patient, and yet we should never be flippant about sin, whatever that sin is. We always talk about big sins, little sins. You know the difference, don't you? Big sins is what you do, little sins is what I do. That's the difference, right? I just do the little ones. You, yours, ooh, boy, they're really bad. No, sin is sin. As far as separating us from God, I know sins have different consequences here on earth. But as far as causing that barrier, that gap between us and God, there's no difference. Sin is sin, and we should always take it serious. And it kills you. It saps the life right out of you. There's reasons why God says not to do these things. You may not understand the reasons. I don't understand a lot of the reasons. To be quite honest, but if my God says don't do it, there's a reason for it. Whether I understand it or not. And I should not do it. And if my God says do it and I don't do it, that's the sin of omission, isn't it? James 4, 17, anyone who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. If my God says to do it and I don't do it, I sin. And sin saps the life right out of me. Next point here. Number three, when sin takes away life, you die. Let's go to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter 7. I do encourage you to read these. I think that it, it helps you to understand so much better if you will follow along in the Bible. When sin takes life away, you die. Look at how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive, and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin... Taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. 
Paul says there was a time in my life, and he's talking actually about when he was a Pharisee. He was a religious person. He was a person who believed he was doing the right thing and following God. And he says, I was dead. The commandment was presented to me. The word was presented to me. And then I knew what sin was. And I chose sin over following God. And I died. You see, it's not the commandment that kills us. It's the sin. So you can be walking and talking and breathing right now and be spiritually dead inside. And look no different. And nobody knows but God. God knows, and you probably know too. But that's what spiritual death is. Number four, God's commandments reveal what sin is. And it's the sin that slays us. It's the sin that kills us. Not the commandments. The commandments are not, not bad. In fact, you should want to know the commandments. If you want to be right with God, you should want to know if what you're doing is a sin or not. You should be hungry to find out. I, if, if this is wrong, I want to change it. I want to be right with God. That should be your attitude. But it's the sin that slays us. So if you're following along, we start off alive, and then we die. And now point C, then we're made alive again. Let's get to that point. Number one, sin executes us. So being free from sin is what makes you alive. If sin kills you, if you can get away from sin, that's what makes you alive. Back up to chapter 6 of Romans. And look at the first two verses with me. What should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, if you're going to understand the book of Romans, you have to understand two things, two phrases that sound similar, but they are very different. Die to sin and die from sin. Those are very, very different. Up to this point in my sermon, I've talked about dying from sin. I've talked about how sin kills you. That means you die from sin. Sin has killed you. But here, Paul is talking about dying to sin. Look at verse 2. We die to sin. That's totally different. In fact, it's almost the opposite. Because if I die to sin, that means I'm pushing sin away from me. I'm tired of it. I don't want it in my life. If you're dead to something, that means that you don't respond. Wives, when your husband's watching that football game on TV, he is dead to the world, is he not? And you can ask him anything you want. He's not going to respond. Yeah, dear, I'll do that later. Okay. okay. He's dead. Dead to the world. That's what it means to be dead to sin. I don't respond to that anymore. Used to. I used to respond. Oh, sin, sin. Yeah, let's go. Let's do it. Not anymore. I'm dead to that. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We can't. And then dropping down to verse 16, he says, Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now what kind of death is he talking about there in verse 7? Die to sin or die from sin? This is die to sin. When we die to sin, we are freed from sin. From sin. Verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that He lives, He lives to God. Paul is drawing this, this parallel between us and Christ. You know, Christ died. He died for our sins on the cross. And after he died, he was buried. He was placed inside of a tomb. But he was raised from the dead after three days. We all know the story. And Paul in this chapter is making an analogy. He actually does this in the first four verses. That we die as well. We die to our sins. We're buried in the watery grave of baptism. Immersion into Christ. And then we're raised, we're resurrected to walk in newness of life. We follow the pattern of Jesus. Look at verse 11. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, 
but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be your master, or shall not be master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace." We're not mastered by sin anymore. We're to be made alive. We put our sin away from us. When you were baptized into Christ, you put your sin away from you or you were supposed to. Not that we are perfect. There's none of us perfect. But we are to be done with sin. You shouldn't have any sin in your life as a believer that you're not dealing with. That you're not trying at least to drive out of your life. That shouldn't exist. We're done with sin. We put it away. And we are given life. This is the same chapter, even though this is not in your notes. The last verse, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's the wages of sin. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Number two. Turn away from sin so that Christ can make you alive. To turn away from sin, that's what repent means. And we need to do more than just repent. We need to surrender. A, a sister shared this with me in a text this week. I thought it was really good. She says, we repent enough to be forgiven, but do we surrender enough to be changed? Something to think about, isn't it? Are we willing to repent just enough because we want to be forgiven? But are you willing to surrender, not just be committed? I was, I was on this soapbox a few weeks ago about uh, how I've preached for years and years. You need to be committed. Be committed. Be committed. I, I preach that so many times. Don't just be involved. Be committed. I wish I could go back and change all that. Don't be committed. Be surrendered. Be surrendered. That's actually what the Bible says. Jesus emphasized being surrendered. Because if you're committed, that's something you control, right? You do that. I'm committed. Surrender means I give up the control. And if you give up the control, then Christ is in control. Are you willing to surrender enough to be changed? Turn away from the sin so that Christ can make you alive. Number three. Christ can forgive your sins and can reunite you with God. You know, in Colossians 2 verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. When you were dead in your transgressions. Paul is taking us back to that moment. For some of us, it may have been... A long, long time ago. For some of us, not very long ago. When you were dead in your transgressions. Do you remember what your heart was like? An uncircumcised heart. He's drawing here the comparison circumcision. I'm not going to give a lot of detail about that. But it's the cutting off of the flesh and casting it away. Is that good enough? Use your imagination from there, alright? That's what circumcision is. The cutting off the flesh and casting it away. When you have an uncircumcised heart, you have a heart that has not removed the, the, the worldliness, the sinfulness of your nature. You keep that, the flesh. He's saying there was once a time when you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your heart. But He made you alive. He's the one who has your transgressions forgiven. Because you see, it doesn't do any good for us just to repent of our sins, just to stop doing them, because we still have the stain of our sins. We have to be forgiven. We cannot do this without Christ. I don't care how good you are, you cannot make it, you cannot repair your broken relationship with God if you don't have the blood of Christ. It's impossible. 
because you've got to have the forgiveness. Without it, you cannot be made alive in Christ. Last point. Verse 4, or excuse me, point 4. Let Christ show you what real living is all about. What is real living all about? You know, before I became a Christian, I was so hesitant to, to give my life to God because I thought, I really don't need more rules in my life. I got rules at home from my parents. I mean, I got rules at school. We have state laws we got to follow. Why do I need more rules in my life? That's just going to take life away from me. I was so misinformed. Following Christ doesn't take life away from you. It actually gives you life. It sets boundaries out there so you know what the boundaries are, so you know how to live. It keeps you away from things that you shouldn't be involved in. Let me give you three scriptures. First one is John 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. See how that's the opposite of what I believed? Christ said, I'm coming. I want to give you life. I want to show you what real living is all about. Follow me and you will have life. Real life. And then this second scripture, Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. What happens when we die to our sins and we're buried in baptism? We get newness of life, a brand new life. We're born again. God gave us a life. What would we do with it? We messed it up. We messed it all up. God puts that old life aside and says, don't forget about it. You know, forget that one. That one doesn't even count. Here's a brand new life. Show me some place where you can get that other than in Christ. There is no other place where you can find that except in Christ Jesus. One more scripture. Colossians 3 verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our hobby, appears. Is that what that verse says? <laughs> when Christ, who is my religion, is revealed. That's not what that verse says. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed. Then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Don't be a zombie. Okay? I don't want you walking out of this building like this, all right? Don't, don't do that. <laughs> First of all, the neighbors will really stare, and they'll be wondering what's going on down there at the Church of Christ. Don't walk out of here as spirits of zombie either. Christ wants to make you alive. He wants to show you what real living is all about. But you have to surrender. You have to be willing to let Him have control. You are born physically into this world. You died when you chose sin. When you willingly decided, I am going to sin. I know it's wrong. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. But that sin can be forgiven. It can be wiped out. You can give your life totally to God and be reborn. But it takes resolve. Our invitation to song is, I am resolved. If you are resolved to make a change in your life, and you want to do that right now, please come as we stand and sing.